you know, when you're living through history, you often don't realize that what you're experiencing is a historic event. I think if you read the history books and you see people who were involved in things that ultimately turned out to be historic, rarely, with few exceptions, did they realize that what they were doing was something that was historic. We are living through one of a less than a handful of the most devastating pandemics ever to confront human civilization. Count them. Pandemic flu of 1918, 50 million people died in one year. It was acute and it was self-limited. It didn't linger. Smallpox, the plague, HIV. So if you look at, count on one hand, we happen to be living through something that very few generations live through, that certainly very few public health officials and scientists live through, where you are fighting a disease that is continuing to rage and kill people, and we have very little to do about it, except for the great success in therapy. But, interestingly, therapy is something that is unusual compared to other diseases. It has to be given for life, and there's a real problem in access in the developing world. Now, in 2009, with PEPFAR, with the Global Fund, with the Clinton and Gates Foundation, Médecins Sans Frontières, there are over 3 million people. Having said that, 3 million people are receiving effective antiretroviral therapy. Having said that, of all the people in low and middle income countries who need therapy, 30% are getting them. For every one person we put on therapy, two to three people get newly infected. So we're faced with a very dramatic situation. Despite the spectacular success of therapy, the epidemic is out of control. So what's the answer? The answer is prevention. And what is prevention? Prevention is a lot of things. One of the things prevention is, is vaccine. places like Sub-Saharan Africa to see the devastation, that has a very, very powerful motivating force. For the first time in my medical career, I actually got goose pimples and I said, oh my God, this is an infectious disease, but why is it only in gay men? at this point in time. So as the disease started to unfold in July and August and more cases were being reported, I decided in the summer of 1981 that I would change the direction of my laboratory and I would focus only on this unusual disease which was called at the time gay-related immunodeficiency or GRID. And I started admitting patients to my ward and I started to study what I could study about them. We didn't know it was a virus. We didn't have a virus. It was acting like a virus, and it was destroying the immune system. Vaccines, in general, classic vaccinology, is based on the premise that we see what the body does in natural infection, and we try to mimic it. And I call that the classic vaccinology proof of concept. Namely, if you look at smallpox, polio, measles, hepatitis, you name it, the, the diseases for which we've had successful vaccines, nature, i.e. natural infection, proves the concept for the vaccinologist and says, although some people die, some people get ill, at the end of the day, the vast majority of people not only are cleared of infection, they eradicate the infection, and they're protected, usually lifelong, against subsequent challenge. So all we vaccinologists have to do is to develop a vaccine that mimics natural infection. We were focusing on the classic paradigm, which is understandable, because as a matter of fact, that's how vaccines have been developed for decades and decades and decades. As we were developing vaccines, we started to see that some of those classic paradigms didn't hold, like it was very difficult in the natural state to develop neutralizing antibodies. Nobody 
essentially nobody eradicated the virus from their body. There's a small percentage, less than 5% of long-term non-progressors who can seem to control virus replication very, very well with essentially undetectable virus. But inevitably, the virus progresses, the disease progresses, and the immune response is inadequate. Only now are we really going and looking at things that we were beginning to learn years ago, namely that this is a very, very strange virus with some properties that no other virus that we've ever confronted has. I was sitting at my desk and I got a phone call from Larry Corey. Uh, and Larry, he sounded like he had been hit by six trucks. He, I've never heard him sound so badly. He says, Tony, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. And I said, well, try me. And he did. He said, there's nothing there. There's not even a hint or a whiff of any effect. There was a lot of um, discouragement among people. And my job was to not downplay the fact that this was not uh, a positive result, but to remind them that that is the nature of research. Research is fundamentally a bunch of failures with an occasional bright light of a success. So that's not necessarily something that's surprising for someone who's done research all their life. I would say that people ask me, are you down? Are you really depressed about this result? And I look at them and say, what are you talking about depressed? This is not an emotional issue. This is science. It's strictly business. It's nothing personal. So I don't get depressed about it. I say, where do we go from here? To, to say we don't know we're going to have a vaccine, nobody's interested in that. That sounds sort of very vague. The press likes to hear either we'll never have a vaccine, that's news, or we're going to have a vaccine in one or two years, that's news. But hey, I don't have any idea when we're going to have a vaccine. That's really not news. So when people ask me, I give them non-news. So let me give you non-news. I don't have a clue. A, when we'll have a vaccine that's effective, or B, if we will even ever have a vaccine that's effective. Now, when I say that latter, people go, oh my God, the man who's responsible for all of the funding for vaccine, not all, but a substantial part of it, he says he's not sure of whether or not we're gonna have a vaccine. And let me tell you why I can, with some degree of comfort, say that. Because as I have said many times, Unlike other vaccine endeavors, the HIV vaccine situation is still in the stage of discovery. We still don't know how and why and if and when a body makes a robust neutralizing antibody and T-cell response. So whenever you're in the discovery phase, discovery is haphazard, sometimes blind alleys, sometimes eureka moments, completely unpredictable. And even though I'm cautiously optimistic, I don't know if we'll ever have one in the classic sense of being 95% protective of people. I don't know when and how that's going to happen. Am I diminishing our efforts? No. In fact, I'm accelerating the vaccine research efforts, at least on the part of NIAID. You can't, you can't you know, hurry, you know, they say you can't hurry love, <laughs> you can't hurry fundamental basic research. You can put more resources into it, but you can't, strictly speaking, hurry it. So we're learning more and more, and at the same time, people are trying other approaches. If we can, with our own capabilities, our intellect, our will, our drive, our resources, get to a situation where we can manipulate the immune system to do something that natural infection doesn't seem to be able to elicit it to do, what else can we do with the immune system? I mean, it's just the vista is, is, is almost in, infinite in what you can do. It's a high risk, extraordinarily high impact endeavor. If you want a guarantee, this is not for those kind of people. If you want to get involved with something that could possibly transform one of the most incredible epidemics we've ever faced, come join us.